Welcome to this morning session. My name is Ling Tre Ling. I'm an executive producer at Channel News Asia, which is based in Singapore, but we're a regional channel. We reach 73 million viewers uh, in the Southeast Asian region. I'm very pleased and honored to have uh, developed together with the World Economic Forum's great team this topic editorially, which is perhaps one of the most compelling topics that we're going to be facing in the next 10 years. Asia has been that major driving force in the third industrial revolution. Factory Asia, everybody knows this term. But what about the fourth industrial revolution? Is Asia going to be able to take the lead then? So these are these questions that we're going to be addressing in this morning's panel. With me are a very distinguished guest, Mr. Thomas Lembong over here, the chairman of Indonesia's Investment Coordination Board. He was also former trade minister, so I'm sure you all know him very well. Next to him, Shalindra Singh from Sequoia Capital. Anybody who knows technology will, of course, know who he is. <laughs> Mrs. Carrie Lam, chief executive of Hong Kong. Chairman Xu from Tsinghua Holdings. I'm sure you're all very familiar with him, but those of you perhaps who are not so familiar may not realize that you, the person sitting here is actually the head of one of the largest semiconductor companies in the world. So uh, a force to be reckoned with and definitely somebody who will be able to talk about the next 10 years. And last but definitely not least, in fact, he may be the only one who will have a job in the next 10 years, William Tanui Jaya, co-founder of Tokopedia, enormous e-commerce site in Indonesia. Okay. We put out a series of poll tweets uh, on Channel News Asia and World Economic Forum to ask all of you what you thought was going to be happening uh, over the next few years. We asked the question of what industries, what jobs do you think are going to disappear in the next 10 years? And this is what the response of more than 2,000 WEF and Channel News Asia viewers was. Okay. 55% basically said there are going to be no more taxi drivers. 38% said no more accountants. But on the other hand, Mr. Shah Rukh Khan and Mr. Jackie Chan can all be extremely happy because actors are, they're <laughs> definitely going to be around in the next 10 years. I'm going to kick off by asking Mrs. Carrie Lam what she thinks, whether she agrees with this. Um, she's very concerned about what's happening in Hong Kong and about whether it can stay as dynamic as it has been. So what do you think? No more taxi drivers? No more Hong Kong taxi well, drivers? This, this survey outcome is uh, very interesting, but actually one will have to deep, dig deeper. When we said the taxi drivers will disappear, are they going to be replaced by Uber drivers, <laughs> because taxi drivers are the professional taxi drivers, but Uber drivers are really part-time, uh, shared economy type of drivers, or they're going to be replaced by autonomous uh, cars and driverless cars. But never mind whether it is uh, Uber uh, drivers or autonomous vehicles, they are also part of the fourth industrial uh, revolution in terms of uh, new technology. Um, I welcome this opportunity uh, to talk about this fourth industrialization because we are about to embark on this journey in order to diversify Hong Kong's economy. Of course, we are no longer manufacturing hubs, so I can't really contribute a lot to the factory of Asia. But uh, in terms of our professional services, which now account for 92% of our GDP, I do see a lot of benefits to, to advancing our professional services in the application of technology. So in financial services, we can have fintech. In medical services, we could have biotech. And in advancing education, particularly for young kids, we could have edutech. And of course, there we have a smart city. And also, particularly in looking after the elderly, there's huge potential for gerund technology. So I do agree that actors will not disappear. Actually, a lot of services will need more jobs, uh, particularly in looking after elderly people. On the hospitality side and on the care side, we will need a lot more people to work in those areas. I'll move on now to Mr. Lembong in Indonesia because Indonesia and China actually still, suffer, still have a similar structure in the sense that there are quite a lot of people who are actually involved in agriculture and also in manufacturing. So what's going to happen to them and will those industries still continue? I think um, in that respect, the fourth industrial revolution will be very similar to the third and the second, right? 
in that uh, these new technologies will expedite the industrialization uh, of, of such sectors, like agriculture will become more mechanized, mm -hmm. manufacturing will become even more automated, right? Uh, <clears throat> but I would like to cite one fantastic headline from the South China Morning Post, mm -hmm. which said that uh, the robots are coming uh, not to replace us, but to give us a promotion. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, in Indonesia, we actually feel uh, similar to Chief Executive Lam, mm -hmm. that as more and more robots are coming, and as more things get more automated or manufactured, uh, the, the premium on the human touch will get bigger, right? The public's appreciation for handcrafted and artisanal and, you know, human interest, human touch, <clears throat> and this goes to Chief Executive Lamb's point about services, right? <clears throat> so uh, I certainly believe that the automation, the artificial intelligence will actually liberate us to focus more on things of the heart, uh, <clears throat> things that are very human uh, uh, <clears throat> in, in, in our day-to-day -day work and our day-to-day -day lives. Chairman Xu, um, Tsinghua is known for always being cutting edge. It takes its origin, in fact, from Tsinghua University. So there's no lack of technology and uh, high-tech thinking within your industry. But China is not all Tsinghua Holdings. There are a lot of other people there as well. How is China going to cope with the fourth industrial revolution? Uh, I have to speak Chinese. Uh... Well, I think so, the mankind has been developing uh, with technology. What do we do with technology? I think it's always a tool. It serves the mankind. It replaces traditional labor. The fourth industrial revolution, I think the biggest thing about this one is that uh, it, it has the ability to learn. It learns and replaces some of the human intelligence, but that's not to be feared. As long as technology is applied to bring benefits to mankind, then it's not something for us to fear. I think the fourth industrial revolution, or even later, machine. I think it will never replace our thinking, our imagination. It cannot replace the communication of emotions, that kind of warmth only human beings can impart. Therefore, we don't need to fear, uh, even if the taxi drivers disappear, then perhaps the uh, uh, moderator or anchor will disappear. There will be machine, but there will be other things through which human beings can communicate with each other and work together, and therefore, culture. Anything that has to do with your mind, with your spirit, those type of products, and also things through which you uh, demonstrate your imagination, they will flourish. One of the things my children are doing, are they, they bring younger people together uh, to have fun. That's great. Once we get rid of the simple labor, and replace that with a higher level of activities. That's a great thing. I do not feel worried about uh, uh, unemployment because there will be new industries. Worried <laughs> about this. Um, Mr. Singh, though, do you think, as an investor in high tech companies, so you're going to have an even greater number of companies to invest in? You know, it's all going to be booming. You know, the young kids are going to be all entrepreneurs. Is that a realistic vision, or is it really just a small portion of society where that's going to be taking place? You know, our view is that, um, especially in Asia, we have many different trends that suggest that we will leapfrog mm. uh, how traditional developed world has, has uh, you know, incumbent industries have developed. Mm. So we see all kinds of traditional industries, whether it's banking, or it's retail, or it's pharmaceuticals, et cetera, um, get uh, you know, in various ways need to evolve with, uh, with the advent of today's deep tech, you know, fourth uh, industrial revolution technologies. So we, th we find the menu of investment opportunities is significantly more wide uh, and has depth than ever in history. 
So, uh, and especially for Asia, our view is that uh, because many of the economies in Southeast Asia, even China to a degree, especially India, are still emerging and developing, uh, there is very significant leapfrog potential and there are multiple examples uh, of companies we've invested in which, uh, which are doing exactly that. William? You're, the, as I said, the classic person. You're the entrepreneur. You're probably the one who should be least worried uh, of all the <laughs> panelists. Um, how do you see things uh, developing in uh, Indonesia? Because your sector, of course, is booming. Um, but uh, on the other hand, can everybody else uh, come along with this uh, as well? And a lot of the service sector uh, that we're talking about, we mustn't forget that a lot of the service sector can also be low-paid jobs. Mm not particularly well-skilled, mm. and with not much of a future. The World Bank has actually pointed that out. They put out a report about why manufacturing still matters for Indonesia, and in fact, for most developing countries. Um, what do you think? Yeah. <clears throat> so Indonesia is the largest archipelago country in the world. We have 17,000 islands. Um, so it's actually almost impossible for us to build equal infrastructures across the country. So it actually creates a couple of like social issues. One is like if you are living in a small city, you actually need to pay a higher price for the product and services that people in the big city can enjoy. If you are starting a business in a small city, you also need to saving for the next generation to move to the bigger city to access to the bigger market. Eight years ago, we started a company not, being, um, not because of we think technology is the next wave, but we want to solve that uh, situation how we can actually democratize commerce through technology. And through the marketplace business model, together we already have 2.6 million uh, business grow together in our platform. And surprisingly, 70% of them are first-time business owners. They are stay-at-home mom, stay-at-home parents, college student, office worker, that in, the, in our parents' generation, our uh, grandparents' generation has no chance to start the business to access the whole market like Indonesia, but today they have that chance because of the technology. So I, I think that Asia, we can actually benefit for, from the second mover uh, advantage. Uh, leveraging our youth population, <coughs> leveraging do massive domestic consumption, and leveraging interconnected uh, economies. I see there's, there will be like two trends. One is like used to be on the factory Asia. Asia is learned from the world, like for the, it's, there is a like a crystal ball effect or time machine effect, right? When China first time created the search engine, Pi2, or like create the first uh, marketplace platform, Alibaba, people from the world always refer that Pi2 is Google of China. Mm. Alibaba is uh, eBay of uh, China. But today, actually, I see that the trends change to Asia. Uh, the world will learn from Asia. So for example, in the Southeast Asia, when we started, we are no longer benchmarking ourselves only to US or only to Europe we start to learn that what happens in China, what happens in India will definitely happen in Southeast Asia, right? So that Asia learn from the world will become the world learn from the Asia. And the second trend that we see that Asia will no longer be the market, but it will be changed to become the enjoy to become the players and become the makers. We are the home is Asia. We are the home of 60% population in the world. We have a huge, huge market, but thanks for this fourth industry revolution, thanks for this new technology, in the less, one, less than one decade, we see a lot of homegrown entrepreneurs um, with a mission to, to prosper the, the, the people of their country, comes up with the local innovation and with the ambitions to compete with the global players. This is, again, something that we, we never see in our parents' or grandparents' generation. Do you agree, Mr. Lembong, that you can leapfrog across, so to say, the middle uh, mucky bit of the manufacturing uh, and just move straight into the high-tech services? <coughs> so, uh, as usual, <coughs> when you start looking at things from a policymaker or regulatory perspective, things are not as straightforward and not as simple. <laughs> <coughs> so, <coughs> I think uh, manufacturing uh, will definitely be less of a source of jobs uh, than in the past, right? <coughs> as uh, our fellow panelists have pointed out, the low-end simple tasks will be automated. And, and more and more things will be automated. But especially big countries have no choice but to have a big manufacturing base, even for balance of payments issues, right? even for macroeconomic balance issues. Uh, so even if all of our factories were automated, you still need them, because from a balance of payments or macroeconomic policy perspective, the numbers don't add up if you try to import everything. Right? So <clears throat> manufacturing certainly isn't going away. 
And um, uh, the other thing I would point out is that, uh, to my knowledge, uh, Asia uh, is, is the strongest area in the world for science and technology graduates, right? Mm -hmm. So engineers, uh, programmers, coders. Uh, <clears throat> so I think uh, Asia is actually in a very, very strong position, mm -hmm. right, to, to build the manufacturing base of the future, right, because so much will be software oriented, sure. uh, so much will have to be highly engineered, right? So I think Asia potentially is the last place or the last region in the world that really needs to worry about it. I think uh, other areas in the world that are not as strong in science, technology, and engineering would have to be more worried about, about that. Can I um, echo the optimism about Asia in this uh, fourth industrial revolu revolution that both uh, William and Tom have mentioned? Um, Asia, of course, in recent years have been the main driver of economic growth, accounting for 60% of the growth in GDP, and China alone accounted for 30%. Uh, I see a lot of uh, potential um, in Asia. One is, of course, because, um, as Thomas mentioned there, I see this uh, <coughs> really amongst the young people, this urge and this hunger for doing well uh, and, uh, in terms of innovation and technology. Secondly, as William said, this is uh, a place with a large population and a growing middle class who will aspire for all these uh, services and so on. And thirdly, it's a little bit of geopolitical uh, consideration. It's this interconnectivity in Asia. Whereas in other parts of the world, I'm, I'm afraid we are seeing some fractured <laughs> here and there. But here, Asia is very well connected. Uh, take Hong Kong as an example. We have just signed a free trade agreement, an investment promotion and protection agreement with the 10 member nations of ASEAN. And ASEAN has been going for 10 plus 1, 10 plus 1, 3, 10 plus 6. And on top of that, we have the Belt and Road, which will connect all these um, Asian economies. So with that sort of connectivity will come, uh, that we will complement each other. For example, I mentioned Hong Kong doesn't have manufacturing. But there's no reason why a lot of manufacturing hubs in Asia could not make use of our professional services for the raising of capital, for the management of risk, and for um, infrastructure services and legal arbitration services and so on. So uh, this, all these factors um, give me a lot of optimism about Asia. Chairman Xu, but what about in China with the state-owned enterprises, mm. which are still largely focused on manufacturing? Uh, as Mr. Limbong mentioned about policy and policymakers, you can't, it's not as simple as that. So what's going to happen with all the state-owned uh, enterprises in China? <laughs> I think this question should be answered by Mr. the chairman of SASAC, who is managing state-owned assets. I also have the optimistic attitude like two other panelists. Not only Asia has a big market, we are also a very open marketplace. Today, this year, we are talking about how to create a shared future in a fractured world. And Asia is exactly doing this. We already have some advantages here. We will continue with these advantages. For China, as you said, we have many SOEs. Actually, SOEs of China are transforming, for example, shareholding structure transformation or more market mechanism into SOE management. So I'm also confident here. Tsinghua Holdings will, is trying to have a more flexible mechanism, more market-oriented mechanism. As you said, we are also a semiconductor company. It's already, it already has a share, mixed sh shareholding structure, which can combine the overall national strategic planning and market uh, dynamics. Uh, Mr. Singh, uh, in, in this being able to, now you've heard mentioning about connectivity, uh, you know, the transformations that are going to take place. Do you actually see that taking place? And can we have business models here in Asia which are going to be different, significantly different from the ones that we see in, uh, in the West? Or are we just merely following the same pattern, just a little bit further behind? Yeah, it's, uh, uh, I think it's a very, very important question. And um, we think 
what technology is doing and uh, fourth industrial revolution technologies like AI are, are a key enabler is essentially we're not doing anything different. We're just changing how we do things. Mm -hmm. The new companies change to do the same things as the old companies do, but they can do it faster. They have um, you know, maybe advantages of data, of distribution, of platform network effects, and so on. I'll quote an example. William uh, has done an amazing job of, of innovating with many interesting things in China. We have a portfolio company called Gojek that employs over, that has over 500,000 drivers in China, and they built a mobile wallet with it. Now, I'll give you an example. Gojek evolved very fast, unlike some of the other ride-hailing companies, into a full platform business with payments, logistics, and food delivery, uh, and they'll probably add more services over time. Now, interestingly, five, 600,000 drivers in Jakarta can accept money into their wallet every day. And so, you know, here's a new paradigm, a new way. It's the same thing. It's a mobile wallet, so it's not a new phenomenon, but how people access the wallet has suddenly changed. And the local regulations that allowed them to do that and the licenses and so on and so forth have now you know, created a new paradigm in financial services called GoPay, which we think will probably evolve into a very, very strong force in financial services. Now, this is a great example. You know, um, uh, many of the other global uh, ride-hailing companies, et cetera, have not had this focus on the adjacent, let's say, payments market. So there are many such examples. We have a company called Oyo Rooms in India, which, is, uh, which has uh, evolved into a, a full-stack um, hotel platform company for uh, you know, affordable hotels. Um, and uh, we had just invested in a company called One Championship that is taking a mobile-first approach to building a sports franchise. And it's uh, now become Asia, Southeast Asia's number one sports media property. And um, you know, their mobile video views and their focus on online mobile community and learnings from what's happening in China will hopefully help them leapfrog how a traditional sports franchise has been created, run, distributed, and so on and so forth. So we see across industries um, this play, uh, playing out where all of these companies are in sort of uncharted territory. And the same, uh, by the way, the Chinese companies in, this, in Sequoia's portfolio are incredible mm. at having created new paradigms. You know, there isn't the equivalent of a Tao Tiao in the US, mm. um, which has you know, blossomed. There isn't an equivalent of a VIP kit. Um, uh, there's a new company called Pin Duo Duo in e-commerce that is on fire in China and will be huge in the next one or two years. And there isn't a global comparable. So I think in Asia, we are seeing these mutations of business models which are creating very powerful new entities at immense scale and very, very rapidly. And the constant uh, feeling inside of our heads is that of surprise and saying, hey, we got lucky once again because you know, we didn't anticipate. With William at Tokopedia, we had no idea that it would become so big so fast. And uh, you know, that's the truth. Um, and you know, Gojek beat our fifth year or seventh year forecast in, in nine months of launch. So I think the, the interesting thing about Asia is because of this interconnected economy with highly affordable mobile devices, low cost devices, now major bandwidth changes in countries like India where Reliance Geo has really leapfrogged uh, you know, with low cost uh, 4G bandwidth. What we are finding is that um, you know, the speed and the velocity of the new business models developing into mainstream large businesses, what used to take 10 years is happening in one or two, three years. But then the, perhaps the rather uh, pressing question for all the persons standing here is, is that can we keep up, as in us little human beings? Are we going to be able to keep up with this tremendous speed? I can understand that William's going to be running way ahead of me, but can I catch up with him? So in other words, a lot of these that you have mentioned also are based in uh, using a lot of fairly unskilled labor. What is going to happen to the Gojek driver? Yeah. Gojek is going to do fantastically well. But the Gojek driver, what is his future? Where is he going to go? How is he going to upskill? Shuling, <coughs> I would like to try to answer that. Um, <coughs> these uh, Gojek motorcycle drivers or Grab motorcycle drivers, uh, first, uh, to join those platforms, uh, they've gone from not knowing how to turn on a smartphone <laughs> Uh, to now knowing how to download the app, <laughs> uh, update the app regularly, how to use uh, GPS uh, location services, uh, how to uh, turn photographs into PDF, 
uh, and, and other advanced mobile smartphone uh, sir, you know, uh, facilities that, uh, that they were completely unfamiliar with. Uh, and we're talking hundreds of thousands and soon millions of people who are learning uh, the gateway to the global internet by learning uh, or by becoming smartphone proficient. Number two, uh, these motorcycle drivers were motorcycle drivers before, but they were in the informal sector. By joining these platforms, they're now in the formal sector, uh, where with apologies, uh, as regulator and policymaker, we can tax them, mm. right? Uh, we can tax them, we can regulate them. Uh, so uh, uh, e-commerce and digitalization and the fourth industrial revolution is not only a creative destruction. Uh, it is actually an organizing force. Uh, it is actually helping to bring people from the informal sector into the formal sector. The combinations of many of the things we're going to be seeing, uh, it's not just technology, though. Mm. Um, for example, Hong Kong is putting a great deal of money now into increasing its R&D. Mm. But I'm sure, Mrs. Lam, you know that, that R&D is only part of the puzzle. Sure. Yeah. There's so many other pieces that have to go in, mm. just as you, Rosa William, have said, that technology is, is insufficient. Yeah. So is there some kind of sort of like a magic formula, though, a magic recipe in which we say that if we add sort of two parts R&D mm. plus uh, a certain amount of, you know, flexible thinking of people, young people mm. who are going to be playing, you know, in China, all are going to combine to give us this fourth industrial revolution, uh, you know, fantastic boost. Well, because I'm speaking as a policymaker, so I have to be very realistic on how we can achieve. So uh, last year in my policy address, in pressing ahead with INT, I have uh, listed out an egg-pronged approach. And our and and funding are only two areas. We need to nurture the talents, we need to revisit the legislation to ensure that they are aligned with the needs of the new economy. We need to open up more government data to facilitate uh, the development of this new technology. We need, at the end of the day, to do more education. So this brings me back to the point that uh, Lin Yu mentioned earlier about wages. Yeah. I don't think we could expect the fourth industrial revolution to solve all the social problems that any government will have to face. But then there is something for social policies. And every government should be obliged to provide the needed leadership and support for social policies to ensure that some of those truck drivers who are left behind somehow will not be left behind. The president see that not, single, not a single person should be left behind in pressing for economic growth because we want economic growth to be inclusive. So we need really to think hard on what sort of social policies we should put in place to complement the fourth industrial revolution. Well, this question of nobody is going to be left behind, we actually asked, again, Channel News Asia viewers plus World Economic Forum uh, participants, we asked them this question. How well do you think your education has actually prepared you for your current job? And before I give you the results, can I just see a show of hands amongst the excellent people gathered here? How many of you think that your education prepared you for your job? Would you put up your hand, please? Okay, that is a clear, not even less than half. I think that we're something like 10%. Would you say that 10% of the persons? So do 90% of all of you believe that you were not prepared for your job via your education? All right, so you're in accordance, in fact, with all the various people who, who uh, answered the poll. Nearly 70% say they do not feel that their education prepared them for their current job. 33% said that they thought it had. Now, what we're seeing here, although none of us are educationalists, I would say there's a bit of an indictment, though, isn't it? That we are not preparing our, our young and even you know, older persons for their jobs. Now, maybe, I will take, maybe it's because education never can prepare us for our jobs. Somehow jobs are always so dynamic that no matter what you do, it doesn't matter whether it was third industrial revolution or fourth industrial revolution. But we must still entertain the possibility that you know, it does not prepare you for your, for your job. Let's talk to you, uh, let, me, uh, let me ask you, uh, Chen Xu, because Tsinghua uh, Holdings draws a lot of its ideas and its, uh, its origins from the university. And do you feel that the university prepares its young people for the jobs it might be getting with you? Uh, 
First of all, I think university education nowadays in China or in other Asian countries needs to be transformed to fourth industrial revolution will bring a different future. Now we are talking about employment, but in the future, the employment market would be very different. In the future, we don't have to go to uh, our workplace. In the future, our home might be our workplace. For example, my neighbor is working at home. So in the future, we need more people with imagination, creativity, and personality. It should not be they will, will not come out from a standardized or uniformized education. So we have to think about how to liberate imagination, dynamics, and personality for our future generation. This will be the challenge for the future education system. It's not only uh, education on campus. It's also education online. There are many possibilities for online education, which, uh, which is also provided by Tsinghua University. Now, more than 9 million people are using our online education services around the world, including Asian countries. So we provide all kinds of untypical uh, programs, for example, entrepreneurship or very, very new subjects and topics are provided on our online education platform. So with the development of, educate, of technology and lifestyles, people also have different ways of acquiring knowledge and education. It's not only happening on campus, in the university. It's going to be lifelong learning in the future for everyone. You're the youngest person on the panel. Do you think that your education prepared you for being you know, the head of Tokopedia? So I always consider myself as an uh, internet cafe graduated, so I never really go to school, and uh, um, a, a, a proper university, and never go to the business school. But I think internet truly changed my life, right? So when we started Tokopedia, no one understand e-commerce. I cannot hire uh, anyone that understand the business model, I understand how to build it. But thanks to the internet, like um, I didn't even speak English until 2010. Uh, for the first time when I met the investor, they will ask me uh, difficult questions like what is your cohort and whatever. You just ask that you understand that, you just write it down, and then you just say, I will come back to you. And what you do is like you, you go home, you ask Mr. Google, right? So Mr. Google will be giving you all the, all the answers. So, all, all future entrepreneurs, please don't, please don't. This is a very, very clever strategy. So I think that uh, education will never perfectly prepare us for the jobs. But I think it's very important, the organization playing a role on that. It's a very important for every organization to become a learning organization. One of our key culture, because we understand that no one understands this, all the talents that we hire will never understand the business model and it will change so fast, technology will change. The key culture that we put is like everyone needs to have sincerity to serve like a teacher and curiosity and humility to learn as a student. So how we can continuously build this learning organization where everyone is involved being a teacher and involved being a student. And I totally agree with uh, Chairman uh, Xu that uh, life itself is a, is a best teacher. So our schools are actually not as important as we would think. Formal education really doesn't play that, that obvious a role in, in our normal life. Well, would you agree, Mr. <coughs> Limbaugh? <Schilling. coughs> I think uh, <coughs> I would like to take this opportunity to build on Chief Executive Lam's uh, comments on social policy. Uh, and I would like to raise the issue of culture, right? And culture is also partly defined by values, right? Um, I think William and other panelists, uh, Chairman Xu, uh, uh, Shailendra, you know, we've, we've touched on things like sincerity, uh, imagination, right? Uh, I believe the more automated, the more technological our societies become, the more important uh, culture becomes, the more important uh, political leadership becomes, and, and I would go as far as to say uh, the more important moral leadership becomes, right? Uh, because we will need uh, values of community, uh, mutual responsibility, uh, selflessness, uh, farsightedness, uh, and, and, and authenticity uh, more than ever. But can uh, these be taught in school? <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know about all of you, but would you? Uh, 
Chief Executive Lam, you were educated in Cambridge. Were you taught selflessness, sincerity, and imagination? Well, not at that uh, sort of late stage, but all these uh, values were sort of implanted in me and in my peers when we were in secondary and primary schools. I was brought up in a Catholic uh, school. So every day we went to school, the Catholic sisters will be teaching us all these values and um, serving the community and be kind and be polite and so on. So uh, perhaps uh, along with the fourth industrial revolution, we are need a bit of revolution in the school system as well. Instead of just giving them more skills, more knowledge, it's the other way around. We should give them more room, more opportunity, just to dream about their future and to be more curious about the environment. And then they will have this innovation. I have a lot of confidence in our younger generation. I think that as long as they are given an environment which is conducive, they will be able to adapt to and survive in any changing environment. But there's also one thing, apart from a school system, parenthood also needs to be <laughs> reformed. These days, uh, parents are just uh, too demanding on their kids in terms of acqu acquisition of skills and knowledge. <coughs> so more caring parenthood and a more understanding and more trust in their kids will be something that I, I cannot uh, uh, sort of preach uh, to people in Hong Kong, but I certainly feel that uh, these are all very important attributes. Mr. Singh, when you go into uh, a company and look yeah. to see whether you're going to you know, put some money in there, yeah. do you look at their educational qualifications uh, or, or do you ask them some difficult questions and they say, <laughs> oh, it's okay, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> and you still think this, is, this guy could still be clever. Yeah, let me answer that. And I want to build on these two comments. I think it's, it's uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll answer it from a more, um, uh, tactical perspective, uh, I, and, and, and to answer your question uh, first on um, companies, we always say that, you know, can you value a company based on the founder's level of commitment or clarity or sense of purpose or a team's cohesion or how passionately they feel about, you know, solving a problem for society? Um, and we find that the greatest companies, startups that were built, were not built using analytical frameworks. Mm. They were built using trying to solve needs that uh, people felt personally very passionate about. Almost many of our greatest founders were trying to solve their own problems and stumbled into a big opportunity and they found that the rest of the world had those same problems. So coming back to this discussion on, on education, I think skills and structured skills are a little bit different from our unstructured learning. So all the value development, the soft skills, the imagination, the, the culture, et cetera. You know, all of, most of our learning in life happens from real world experiences, mm -hmm. unstructured real world experiences. And which is why I think we find that the smartest people versus the most effective people can sometimes be different. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, and, and so, you know, bringing that back into the, the impact on society with AI, with robotics and so on and so forth, you know, our view is the structured cognitive uh, types of technologies will be the easiest to automate. Mm. So structured cognitive tasks like analytical tasks, mm. data crunching, number crunching. Unstructured cognitive will be the second most difficult to automate. And, and some will never be automated because you can't you know, emulate emotion and so on and so forth. Mm. Um, in fact, in, in investing, they always say, you know, greed and fear are more powerful. Understanding that is more powerful than understanding free cash flow sometimes, <laughs> you know, um, and market psychology. Um, and similarly, unstructured physical tasks. Uh, and yesterday I was uh, attending a session and somebody asked um, a professor from MIT, you know, will robots uh, fold my laundry anytime soon? And uh, the answer is unstructured physical tasks are actually very tough to automate. Mm. So I think when we think of uh, the impact on education, on society, mm. how to, to reskill, et cetera, for the future, I think it's not a black or white answer. There's a gradient across various kinds of things that people are employed in, and the need to, therefore, you know, invest more in education, uh, and so on and so forth. Some of the people we are always looking at uh, whenever we talk about the fourth industrial revolution is the young people, the millennials. Um, and we wanted to see how much people really knew about how much it's going to impact young people. Uh, and this is the question we asked them. They said, how many jobs do you think you're going to have by the time you're age 30. 
well, we have a variety of people here in the audience, um, I'd like to ask you, <coughs> just in your own heads, to think of how many jobs do you think a young person is probably going to have? And then I will ask for the results to come up and you can have a look. Okay, so link, basically we said 26% say that it's going to only be two, so it's going to be quite a salary man kind of thing. Four jobs, four jobs, 41%, and 33% job, more than six. I mean, this is, you know, in the old days, that would be considered positive job hopping. <laughs> you, you're, you're rotating all the time, because it means that in total, really, it's about 70%, uh, you know, at least more than 70%, of all the people who answer this poll, believe that they're really young people are going to have to keep changing their jobs. Now, LinkedIn did uh, an actual question to young people and asked them, uh, on LinkedIn at least, you could argue that LinkedIn is already an old cohort, um, and they said that they thought about four jobs by the time they're, they're 30. So are we going to see uh, a, a world in which industries and people are actually going to be shifting around a lot. Uh, definitely the salary man, I think, is a thing of the past. But uh, how much of this sort of industry hopping uh, are we going to see? Do you see that, Chairman Tree, in your, in, your, uh, in your industries? I think that uh, I'm really admiring the present young people. And because up to not only 30, but up to even now, I have only one job. So I think that what makes it exciting for life is to experience more and to explore more. And if you stay in one place, you will miss all that. And I think that the present young people, um, there is a, a fundamental change uh, in their minds for the concept of the uh, of the jobs and either in our time we are, we were thinking of surviving or earning money to survive to support the family but now the young people on the internet they have they are learned a lot and they they are changing uh, all their ideas constantly and uh, for their lives for the benefit of their lives and of their studies and their jobs so i think that they are thinking uh, that all the jobs are the same. Uh, is that they are experiencing more and they are shifting the, the areas. And I think it's a good phenomenon. And I appreciate that. This uh, job change. We are, we are already seeing this in Hong Kong. Uh, apart from this new economy uh, requirements, there are other factors that would uh, lead to this uh, more frequent job change. One is, of course, this work-life balance. Young people now are more aspiring for this work-life balance, whereas in my days, and like Press, uh, Chairman Xu, it's really more work-oriented. Uh, I have only done one job in my life. And then there is also this issue of remuneration and compensation. <laughs> we are moving away from lifelong pensions and uh, rewarding for long service and so on. So that, again, removes um, a sort of uh, previous barrier so job change, because job change should be something for the good. But because you are so attached to your pension, you'd rather not change your job. So we'll, let, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to face this phenomenon. I think, yeah. <clears throat> I think the key issue is that uh, for sure the old patterns of work, uh, the old patterns of production uh, are changing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, for example, uh, in the future, all of us might be doing two or three jobs uh, at the same time, mm -hmm. right? Um, for example, uh, William already referred to some of his uh, partner sellers are office workers who have a full-time job, but on the side might be selling their handicrafts on Tokopedia, uh, <clears throat> on Instagram, and, uh, and other social media. Uh, there are accountants or, uh, or other professionals who also happen to be hobby bodybuilders or hobby cosmetics people, right? And just by having 300,000 followers, uh, they're getting remuneration for endorsing products uh, or, or reviewing products. Uh, so I think the patterns of work uh, are, are breaking down. Chief Executive Lam also mentioned work-life balance. I think the barrier between work and life will dissolve completely. Work will become your life, and <laughs> life will blend seamlessly into work. Uh, it's inevitable. <clears throat> and um, 
other things like uh, you know we won't be sitting in offices anymore, right? We'll probably be sitting in different offices at different times of year, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, co-working spaces. Uh, you know, we might be even living in different apartments at different times of year, or uh, you know, shifting around a lot more. So things will become more fluid. Uh, that's, that's, I think, the key issue. I can see you want to say something, Mr. Singh, yes. Yeah, you know, I, I think this may not be a bad thing. I have a counterintuitive view on it, because to me, actually, I think if you put yourself in the shoes of a young person, the millennials that you surveyed, I actually think every job is like, um, you know, a huge learning experience. Yeah. Yeah. So when I joined Sequoia about 12 years ago, I couldn't believe my good luck. I couldn't believe that they would pay me to meet some of the brightest, best founders, learn from them, and uh, every day, you know, learn about something new, new technology, new area. And I felt the same way in my prior job when I was, uh, worked briefly at Bain & Company. And I couldn't believe after business school that they would pay me to learn so much. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, for millennials, you know, every job is a learn tremendous learning opportunity. And actually doing two or three different things may give them different perspectives and almost multidisciplinary or different contexts to learn from and give them many more unstructured kinds of learnings from having that exposure on the early in their lives. So obviously we all want as, you know, you know if I were to put my hat, hat on, you know, if William was to put his hat on as CEO of a startup, he would want his team to stay as long as possible. But if you put the hat of, hey, how are these young people gonna develop? You know, it may not be the worst thing for them to have tried two or three work environments and industries early in their career. It will set them up for success. Uh, in the future, potentially. So I actually want to make a confession. Up to 20 year, 28 years old, I changed job five times. <laughs> and Tokopedia is my sixth job. <laughs> so I, I beat Tokopedia in 28 years old, right? So I'm in that cohort. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> and I, I, I do think that most of the company is a bit like a kingdom. But I, uh, I actually want to build a company like a university. University is actually well known because of their graduation. So until today, I still do this for every single uh, team member that join us, on their first day in the company, I actually tell them, try to find your purpose in life. If you find your purpose in life aligned with Tokopedia, then we both are lucky. But you find it somewhere else, that closer to your heart, it will start a new business or join another organization. We are very happy for you as well. So we, we wish you to graduate and carry that Tokopedia flag as a chapter of your life. So I think that, um, that should be the, the future of the organization. It's being a learning organization, and it encourages your team member to actually graduate and change the world to the better place. OK, so basically, don't be afraid to say, I'm resigning. I'm doing a different job. <laughs> OK, let me go to the audience now. What do you think? I, yes, some questions already from the lady over there. We'll start, and we'll come around to you. Would you mind uh, standing up, yes, and just saying your name and, and your affiliation? Uh, my, uh, I'm from. Uh from the US, my name is Haiyan Wang, a China India Institute. Uh, Chairman Xu and all of the panelists speak of the importance of creativity and imagination. Um, in certain Asian societies, uh, there's still the fear of daring to think differently, to speak openly, freely, differently. That seems to be a bit going backward. So uh, do you see any <coughs> fundamental changes in that aspect? <coughs> I made my question a bit set off. No, no, that, that's a very, it's a very good question. <coughs> what, do, what do you think? It's true, because perhaps it's a stereotype, but in many Asian uh, cultures, um, having a different opinion is seen as being disrespectful as well um, to perhaps your boss uh, to the person who's running the project, <coughs> suggest another way of doing the project uh, might be considered disrespectful. So what do you think? Uh, I think that uh, the change is in the pipeline and in the process. And uh, my generation and uh, even some, some people who are younger than me, they still keep those old uh, customs. But if you look at the people who were born 90s, um, well, they were born into a 
new world. And of course, we need to keep what's, uh, what was good for the uh, traditional, uh, from the traditional days. So I appeal to the parents in China, you shouldn't do all for your children. You should let your children to grow on their own. And I believe that in the future, this will be changed and uh, for the world. Do they say, oh my goodness, he's on to his next job again? <laughs> Sorry, I... Did your family support your setting up Tokopedia, or did they think that you were just going on to yet another, you know, yet another crazy idea? They didn't understand, right? So <laughs> that's for sure, but uh, hopefully now they understand it. Yeah. So therefore, this sure. idea of, of uh, being imaginative and possibly therefore contradicting uh, a Asian uh, culture wasn't I'd like to make a there. provocative yeah. statement. Yes. <clears throat> I would like to uh, <clears throat> follow in... Uh, Singapore, uh, for the late Singapore Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew's footsteps and raise the issue of Asian values. Mm. Fairly controversial concept, <clears throat> but uh, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm quite Americanized. Uh, <clears throat> actually, I grew up in Germany uh, between ages 3 and 10. And yes, we need more dissent. Yes, we need more speaking out. But let me say that there is such a thing as too much freedom, mm. right? And I would urge all of us in Asia not to go over a cliff, mm. right? So yes, we need more vibrant discussion. We need debate, right? Uh, but there's a limit. Mm. Uh, what will happen if you go too far is hate speech, uh, provocation for the sake of provocation, right? And I think that's the last thing we want right now, right? Uh, so some of the extremist free market uh, orientation uh, might argue against social norms uh, or constraints on expression. Uh, but again, to me, it comes back to personal responsibility. Right? It comes back to our responsibility to the community, not to destroy it, right? not to indulge our darker instincts or desires. Well, I think that's a fair point that there's a difference between imagination and hate speech, but I think they're quite different ends of the spectrum. Okay, let's move on to the gentleman over here. Hello, good morning, Ignacio Garcia Alves, Alves from Arso de Little. I had one question, in fact, to know in which direction you think Asia will go, because you can either have, uh, like you had factory Asia, you can have brain Asia, where you say, I will compete against artificial intelligence because we have real intelligence, if you see, and we will provide you flexibility, and etc. Or, or whether you believe that, in fact, um, uh, you, you will go to the uh, other direction, in fact, which is that you will use yourself a lot of artificial intelligence to upskill, in fact, all of the jobs and, uh, and, and more like on the domestic market. Well, uh, as far as Hong Kong, because uh, we are a very small and externally oriented economy, so uh, it would not be wise for us to stick to a particular um, aspect of our economic uh, growth. So uh, in this term of government, what I have um, um, suggested and advocated is to go for economic diversification. So uh, while we are 92% manufacturing, 92% um, services sector, there's no reason why we could restart a bit on the re-industrialization in applying more technology and innovation in reviving some of the manufacturing areas that we are strong. So manufacturing like is not a dirty word to yeah, you. Yes. Like textile and garment, we are very strong and we can benefit from uh, the advances in technology and creativity in design. Even though so it's seen it, as a very low-end manufacturing? Yeah. No, and manufacturing is not very high-end. It could be very high-end. So to answer that question is, I think um, my buzzword is um, some sort of uh, diversified economic development uh, will be good for a, an economy like Hong Kong. Okay, yes, one more question here. Thank you very much. Uh, Vijay Purusami from the QI Group uh, in Hong Kong. I'd like to ask uh, Chief Executive Lam and, and Chairman Zhu, given what we've been hearing about the changes going on, what policy changes are happening in the education system? Chief Executive Lam, what's happening now? And Chairman Zhu, what changes would you like to see in the policy of education? Thank you. <laughs> well, 
Well, I, I must say that I'm wearing the hat of uh, an entrepreneur, but if I am uh, not a politician, but from the Tsinghua, uh, we have an X lab, and uh, we have uh, uh, the a, a space uh, for uh, creation. So we want to uh, promote the uh, um, imagination and the uh, creativity. So I believe that uh, the uh, uh, in the future will combine the curriculum uh, with the practice. Number system, but put in a nutshell, I hope that um, the outcome of our education reforms is to be able to nurture kids, young people, who have this ability to really uh, think in a more lateral manner, and also to be able to possess that international perspective. Because as economic globalization will continue to take place, we, we do not need our young people to have that sort of perspective. OK, I'm afraid that we're going to have to wind things up. We're going to do a last question for each of the panelists. We've talked about the millennials uh, doing a whole variety of jobs. But those of us who are a little bit older, we may need to reincarnate ourselves several times as well. So I just go around the panel and see what sort of new person will they be in 10 years? What sort of different job, what sort of reincarnation will you be in? <laughs> Mr. Limbong, what would you imagine that you might be? In 10 years? Uh, I might be an android by then. <laughs> <laughs> so a cyborg, do you think? I'll be a cyborg by then. <clears throat> and I'll probably be uh, somehow machine enhanced. Uh, and uh, and there will be new biotechnologies uh, implanted in my body. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, you know, I'll have more of a role uh, as a moral leader, right? Speaking from the heart uh, rather than from the head. Mr. Singh. Yeah, you know, there are many predictions that venture capital will change. You know, ICOs and blockchain and automated, you know, ways of funding, crowdsourcing will change venture capital. So we remain awake at night. Uh, we always ask ourselves how we should evolve and change. We don't know the answers, but we uh, keep trying to ask the right questions and keep asking ourselves, what should we do um, in how we, I think some parts of what we do in company building, et cetera, will not change even in 10 years. But yeah, there are many parts of investing that could become highly automated in the next 10 years. So, so part of what you do will be AI, and you will yeah. be doing some other bit? Yeah, no, and we already use AI-centered platforms for many kinds of decision making to aid what we do. We already have platforms that will help us um, you know, find new companies or calibrate data differently and so on and so forth. So you know, we know it'll be different. We don't know how it'll be different. And uh, we keep trying to figure it out. OK, so, so you don't know what your reincarnation is yeah. going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's too dynamic to know today what things will look like in 10 years. What we do know is that it will be the pace of change will be faster than any of us anticipates. And to William's point, I think the learning mindset you know, expertise is less valuable and learning is more powerful in the next decade. And so I think the learning mindset will allow us to evolve. Mrs. Lam. Well. You've had only one job, oh. as you said, so. <laughs> well, having done a job as a chief executive of a Hong Kong special administrative region, there is no incentive whatsoever for me to go into any other job. <laughs> so uh, in five, 10 years' time, I will uh, uh, take on uh, Chairman Xi's advice, lifelong learning. And hopefully, I will be a very tax savvy grandmother so that I could continue to communicate with the younger generation. Great. Chairman Xu. Uh, uh, I think it doesn't matter how the world changes, one thing doesn't change. The happiest person is the one with the biggest heart full of love, whether it's five years or 10 years incarnation, will still mean that I will embrace the world with the strongest love to accept whatever changes that may come. Still be uh, leading Tokopedia, or will you have moved on to yet another project? <laughs> no, I think that I find the purpose of my life when I studied Tokopedia. But I'm for sure, I think business model will continuously change. Technology will continuously change. So one, one thing that I wish that never changed is that desire to continuously learn like a student, and that desire to continuously have a sincerity to serve like a teacher. So 10 years from now, I hope that I can continuously be that student and teacher mindset. 
Well, thank you very much to all of you who have been here. I think that we've had a fantastic uh, lot of ideas. But the most important thing is to keep learning, and that means to keep on talking after this session. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you.